The idea for this evening's program began with a conversation that I had with Robin that started out pretty casual and then took a more challenging turn when Robin asked me, how free is free thought? What an excellent question. And since I didn't have the answer, I decided to get two really smart people to help me think it through. I'm looking yeah, forward right. to this conversation. <laughs> it's been months, Robin, since we had this discussion. <laughs> All right. So Robin Zucker is a Unitarian Universalist minister who embraces a creed-free, dogma-free path of making meaning. Robin finds that theists and humanists alike can be free thinkers. And we have John Hooper, a retired research scientist. He's on the board of the American Humanist Association and Pittsburgh Free Thought Community. John seeks to gain an understanding of the world without supernatural assumptions. John holds that this is what makes free thought free. Their conversation may open your eyes, challenge your assumptions, provoke questions, and perhaps provide some answers. Um, they have We'll be having the discussion between the two of them, and at the end of the discussion, they'll be available to take your questions. Mm -hmm. So let's have at it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I do remember that. We were at the museum, right? Ran into each other at the museum or at a, a fundraiser, and you said, we should continue this conversation. So here we are. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we'd like to start out with is we talk a little bit about interreligious uh, work and how, uh, how that works. Uh, uh, Robin will say a few words about it, and I'll say a few words as well. So um, first of all, good evening. It's really lovely to be here, see a few familiar faces, and meet many new people. Uh, when I was a student at Harvard Divinity School, back in the late 90s. I was part of a program called Seminarians Interacting. I was the first Unitarian Universalist to ever be in the program, which made it challenging because it was divided very in a very um, clear but rigid way. Uh, Protestant, Christians, Catholics, Muslims, liberal Jews, conservative Jews, there was really no place for me. And we had to figure out where to put me. So we put me with the liberal Protestants, which was a very interesting experience since I'm a Junitarian. So like all of the concepts around being a free thinker were really challenged by my place in this program. But it turned out to be a really great experience. And one of the things I learned about interreligious dialogue is that it's meant to be about an engagement rather than agreement. In fact, any kind of dialogue I feel that cuts across different viewpoints should be about engagement rather than agreement. So John and I have discussed that um, in some of our conversations over lunches and such. So I'm hoping that as you listen to our dialogue, you aren't necessarily just listening for agreement with our points of view, but engaging with it, just listening to it. So really it's for understanding rather than agreement. Can you seek to understand our points of view? And then later, maybe process whether you agree or disagree. Okay? It's one of, the, one of the curses of the intelligent, I believe, is that we listen for agreement rather than understanding and engagement. So I just wanted to ask that of the crowd okay. before we begin. Okay. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I think I've had a lot of experience with uh, talking in interreligious or inter- uh, uh, sometimes they call it interfaith. Uh, the Buddhist Stephen Batchelor, he's a Buddhist scholar and uh, practitioner, has said that we uh, swim in the treacherous sea of words. Uh, and what he means is that words mean different things to different people. And I think this is no more uh, apparent than it is in the conversation between so-called religious people and so-called secular people. Even those two words, uh, secular and religious, are... Uh, are a false dichotomy, you know, uh, and we can get into that later if you want. Uh, some people, once they, they say religious, they mean particularly in this country, and uh, for example, the uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation uh, works to, uh, to make sure that religion doesn't get in the way of a, in, in public life, but the religion they're talking about is personalized religion where the God works every day in life, and, and we are a theistic country, but that's, but it's really, uh, 
against the, the theistic kind of religion. So the religion there means people who believe in Jesus Christ as, as the Son of God, okay? A very narrow definition, but that's kind of what it means. Uh, religion, uh, to, from a global point of view, can really mean uh, all kinds of different uh, uh, groupings of people who get together because they have a purpose that's higher than themselves, because they want to uh, celebrate being alive and they do it with other people, that because they because more of a because a combination of people is more is stronger than than one, and because we all need each other. So, no, some of those things are called religions. Uh, Unitarian Universalism, I think, is very interesting because I've always you said as Unitarian Universalism, uh, Protestantism. Uh, well, really, I don't think it is, you know, because the, the last congregation I came from, 30% of the congregants were Unitarians, were Jews. And uh, <clears throat> also, it's not a separate religion, I don't think. I think what it is, is it's a grouping of people who are religious. And there's a big difference between religion and religious. So that's kind of where I'm coming from on this. Go ahead. So, I, I, first of all, the reason they put me with the liberal Protestants is because both Unitarian and Universalist were liberal Protestant denominations historically and yep. so it was the best place to put me. I think that, you know, people ask me all the time um, about Unitarian Universalism mm -hmm. as a religion and they ask questions like, well, what do you worship on Sunday? And, you know, I like to put my tuition dollars to work and I say that the word worship actually is from a old English word, worth Skype, which means to shape meaning. So I kind of feel like Unitarian Universalists are religious. Uh, they worship in a way that's quite authentic. We get together, mm -hmm. as you said. We come together on Sunday morning with our own understandings, our own spiritual perspective, and we shape meaning together, which, which is a really valuable mm -hmm. um, process, rather than all sort of directed at worshiping a single deity or a single idea. We support one another in that free thought, free mm -hmm. thinking, mm -hmm. free and responsible shaping of meaning. Yeah. Well, maybe we should talk a little bit about What's what we think thinker? a free thinker is. You okay. go first. I'm going to go first? Yeah. Okay. Um, again, treasure sea of words. Uh, we're, I'm a founding member, I'm a director of the Pittsburgh Free Thought Community. Why are we call the free thought community? Because that's the only word that all the non-theists in Pittsburgh could agree on. <laughs> okay. So that's why it's the free thought community. It has nothing to do with the deep philosophical meaning. But anyway, <clears throat> and, and I think the reason we agree on it is because we think that the, uh, to, to really have uh, a, 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 an objective, free um, uh, mind, to be actually looking at things in an objective way, there can't be any external kinds of influences. There's no received knowledge in this. You're looking at the present, you're looking at things as they are now. And so totally uh, ruling out any supernatural considerations is the difference, I think, that makes the difference. You know? It's the difference between a free thinker and a critical thinker. It doesn't mean that free thinkers, I think being a critical thinker is a necessary but not sufficient to be a, a free thinker. Right. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, so how would you define something then? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's someone who approaches life and makes decisions based on, on, uh, on a knowledge that does, does not take into consideration any supernatural considerations. On any topic. On any subject. Yes. So, um, we had this conversation um, probably three or four years ago. Yeah, yeah. And then I preached a sermon and I was so glad you were there <laughs> because I um, quite explicitly said that I felt like free thinking was not just the province of humanists. And that I've been a little concerned that humanists have sort of grabbed that word as their own. And I think that Jews can be free thinkers and Christians can be free thinkers. I think it's more the way in which one grapples with their belief system that makes them either a free or a captive thinker as mm -hmm. opposed to what they believe. I, you know, Gandhi once said all religions are true unless they oppress mine. Mm -hmm. And I think free thought also has sort of an inherent respect for other people's free yeah. thought. Yeah. So yeah, I think dogma and creeds certainly tie people down 
and control sort of the framework of their thinking. And what drew me to Unitarian Universalism was that flexible framework mm -hmm. for uh, the freedom the, to wander around a bit in what I believe. But I, you know, the thing about supernatural influences, I'm not sure what you're talking about. If you're talking about the whirlwind or you're talking about, you know, a burning bush or just ideas that are uh, supernatural. Yeah, I, it, I hesitate to get into, um, you know, a real deep philosophical understanding because we don't know. You know, I mean, there's, I'm kind of what you call a soft atheist. I just don't think there's any reason to believe in anything. Not because I'm against people that do believe in anything. So I think that's a different uh, perspective. Uh, but I do think that, um, I'm sorry, I've lo lost the tr transponder. Supernatural. Supernatural, okay. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, there, I think that all there is, is all there is. All there is in front of us, nature is all there is. Now there are parts of it that we don't have any idea how it works. There are, there are things that are, are going on that we haven't even seen yet. I believe that. But I don't think there's some outside agency that exists beyond the, the natural world. So that sounds very Buddhist. I think it is. And I think uh, uh, Buddhism, particularly when it's stripped of, its, uh, of what it's gathered over the centuries of all these practices like, the, like uh, reincarnation and some of the uh, uh, other uh, uh, parts of it, is really fundamentally a, uh, a, an evolutionary process is very much, very much like a, a, a humanism. I think. And I think that's why um, there's uh, a lot of humanists and a lot of atheists uh, really in, uh, practice uh, meditation, but also Buddhist uh, psychology is very much non-theist and very much coming out of what, they, what is a uh, human's interaction with the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so. great. Sounds good. <laughs> so, well, if we go... <clears throat> oh, wait, I, I actually knew what the comment was I wanted to make about that, go if on, that's okay. It. I just forgot. <laughs> so, what you just said, um, if you look at Buddhism sort of at its purest core before things were layered onto right. it, you can say that about most of the world's religions, yes. actually. You know, the difference between this sort of pure message of Jesus and the Gospels mm -hmm. and all the doctrines and rules that layered onto that and some of the pure mystical heart yeah. of Judaism. So I think that's how human beings get involved in uh, using power and control to change mm -hmm. pure and in many ways, free thought, mystical, yeah, pure, yeah. I know we're going to talk about the word mystical, yeah. into something that's complicated and very controlling. Yeah, th there's um, a, a theory of, of religion. One thing that's always fascinated me how is contemplatives mm -hmm. of any religion get along better with each other than they do with the, the, the orthodox in their, in their own religion. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because they're looking for the original relationship with ultimate reality. And the, uh, all religions started with that, with this, with people grappling about what life is all about, what, uh, you know, what is death and life, and what are we doing here, why, where are we going, all that stuff. Uh, and every religion started that way. And then it got, and then it got uh, standardized. And then it got dogmatized. And then pretty soon, it didn't matter what the original struggle somebody was having with why am I here and what am I for. And got, got mm -hmm. into a, a more... Uh, I guess you say pretend, not even pretending, but acting yes. the way you're supposed to act in religion. So I, I think that there's, uh, I, it's, it's fascinating. That's one of the reasons why I'm a Unitarian Universalist. I think there's a, a lot of wisdom in the way people are walking around these different beliefs. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I still don't think anything, believe anything else. Sure. <laughs> but I, but I think there's a heck of a lot of interest in the way people. I'll look at them. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I was, well, here is one of the ministers, uh, two congregants came to me asking to start the UU Christian Fellowship chapter mm -hmm. here, which I now hear is hugely successful mm -hmm. and has quite a following on Sunday morning. But the response in some corners of this very building to that mm -hmm. idea was they were aghast that we would have a UU Christian Fellowship here. Mm -hmm. And this is where my idea of free thinking really comes to the fore is if we can't support someone who wants to turn to that mm -hmm. uh, 
um, they're not, they haven't formed a little Christian church here. They're just yeah. reading things that come out of that tradition, well, well, just like a Buddhist meditation group or a yoga class or yeah, a yeah. kirtan group or whatever. So I think free thought really has to be spread out a little bit more. Well, is it free thought or is it <coughs> kind of a, an acceptance? Uh, like I say, mm -hmm. not an agreement, but an acceptance that other people have the freedom Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, it's the I fourth think principle. It's an expansion of free thought. I think is an expansion of mm -hmm. uh, of uh, tolerance. And sure. Maybe, maybe even celebration, because I think one of one of the things about <clears throat> uh, maybe we should get back a little bit to um, um, interreligious kinds of things. Absolutely. You know? um, sure. What I've found <clears throat> is that you have to really segment the purpose for interreligious gatherings is extremely important. I worked on the, uh, the uh, UUA's uh, Statement of Conscience on Peacemaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of what we were doing is looking at all the different ways that people had attacked uh, peace, make, peace building, uh, making peace, building peace. Uh, and and the, most, the people who were really good at that, particularly on just war theory, for example, are the Catholics. So we did a lot of work with the Catholics in that. The Jesuits and just war theory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, in that particular case, there was the boundaries around it, well, this is the subject we're talking about, and critical thinking went into that. Right. Now, I'm not going to talk to them about birth control or abortion. You know, we're not sure. going to get into a discussion on that with, 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 with Catholics. So, what I've found is that, particularly for Unitarian Universalists and also for humanists, is that going into something without a particular uh, axe to grind, you know, not having dogma, bias, bias or condescension bias. or condescension right. Right. particularly without condescension yes uh, gives you a kind of a, of um, a platform because mm -hmm. everybody's trying to sell something and you're just trying to figure out what the best way forward <laughs> and if if you can if you can uh, hold back on proselytizing non-belief <laughs> you know yes <laughs> and and listen and talk about what thing what what are the uh, what are the commonalities? You know, what are the values that people are really seeking? And how do we find ways to satisfy everybody on this? And, and being sort of a, almost a coordinator of that. Well, I'm you, not interested in satisfying everybody, but... <laughs> well, well, okay, I'm... I'm, I'm I rather... I'm being, I've decided a long time ago that my ministry wasn't meant to be a warm bath. But I'm it wasn't meant to be a cold shower either. Yeah, I'm not yeah. talking about ministry. Right. I'm talking about the social... A social uh, problem. Oh, I thought you were talking about this idea of religions coming together. Oh, yeah, yeah. religions coming and together. And they do, but, like... But, but if it, oh, for example, if you're, if you're in a group and you're, <clears throat> you're trying to figure out um, what approach you should take to a uh, low income, to uh, leaving sure. people who have low income. If you're uh, conservative and probably are a Christian, you'll think that uh, welfare is terrible. You know, people have to work for the work for you. You've got to put a work requirement in. You know, if you're if you're really liberal, you say everybody's got a right to live, and everybody's got a right to a certain level of, uh, of of you know sustainability. If you get together on that, maybe you come up with something that's in between. You know, that's By other people's religious beliefs, and we don't necessarily need to be. I mean, if if someone is really putting their beliefs in our face in a way that denigrates ours, then yeah, mm -hmm. that's to be very triggering. But I think some of those triggers come from our religions of origin. They come from where, how we've been raised and uh, maybe still recovering from that or mm -hmm. feeling the effects of that. And I think there could be better in a religious dialogue if people watch their own triggers and were willing to go into conversations listening for yeah. understanding rather yeah. than agreement. And that happens right here. You know, the Unitarian Universalism is kind of an interesting petri dish for that because mm -hmm. even though we're not covering a broad range, you're not going to find conservative Christians usually right. in the pews. You are going to find a variety of beliefs and, you know, we have to be very careful about having a hidden orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Or as one of my colleagues said, having everyone speak the language of the movement at all times. And maybe that's also true in humanism and free thought. Like, yeah. is there an expectation that everyone's going to speak the language of the movement at all times? And I think that gets back to that whole um, treacherous sea of words. If the definitions that we assign mm -hmm. to words are the only possible definitions, then the language is already a, a barrier. And there's no free thought in that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? They, well, there's, there's uh, <clears throat> yeah, there, there's sort of a, uh, no, you're right, it's almost a dogmatic position. That's right. You're right. Yeah. So, what are some other questions we've come, we came uh, up with questions yeah, we looking, together, okay. we worked on them jointly. Yeah. One, one of the things uh, we had, uh, what uh, compromises do atheists and theists have to make, and are theists, have to make, to be accepted in UU congregations and by each other. Now, can I tell them what the original question was? Oh, sure, the ahead. original question only asked what compromises atheists had to make. Yeah. And what I pointed out to John was a lot of the questions centered free thinkers and atheists only, which mm -hmm. I felt was an interesting, interesting yeah. commonality to the question. So I said, why don't we add both perspectives? and not make assumptions that it's only an atheist that would need mm -hmm. to make adjustments. I'm not mm -hmm. even sure I like the word compromise, but adjustments to perhaps their level of tolerance mm -hmm. of other viewpoints. Like, what if someone has a more the theistic point of view mm -hmm. and they want to hear God language more, or they're a Buddhist and quotes from the Bible really turn them off, or you know, they're an atheist and they don't want to hear any, they don't, they don't want meditation, they don't want silence, they don't want any of that. I mean, that's a typical mm -hmm. Sunday morning in our churches. Mm -hmm. So is it really compromise people are making or are they making a choice to be in, in an environment that will inherently challenge them because it won't always go their way? I, well, yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, the, the important factor there would be together are we doing more than we could do if we were apart. Mm -hmm. And I think in groups where there's a really active uh, program to make the world a better place, mm -hmm. those things get a little bit less important. You know? Definitely. Uh, the other thing I've, I've learned uh, to do is that, um, that I don't necessarily have to believe that something is true to see some truth in it. You know? uh, a while ago, Gail was in a bell choir at a, at a uh, uh, what was the church? That, United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. and it was really quite typically Christian. So I used to go into the Gales concerts there, and I had to sit through the whole damn service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and 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 the way I the way I handled that is I treated it like a novel. Mm -hmm. You know, I go in there, suspend my disbelief, and see if I can learn something about the human condition, and then come back out at the end and be like who I really really am. And there was a guy who gave a he gave a sermon on the on the uh, Sermon of the Mount. One, one, two, one Sunday, uh, and if, you, if I took out all the Jesus saves and, you know, come to Jesus and, and all the other, yeah. and the creed and all that, sure. what he said was pretty interesting, you know? Yeah, blessed are the peacemakers, it's all that kind stuff, of an yeah. old chestnut, you know? Yeah, right, but, <laughs> right. but his, his, his uh, riff on that was really Yes, I can't remember right. what it was, but it was pretty good at the time. Anyway. Well, what's, I don't know if you've ever watched Joel Osteen. Oh, gee, yes. Okay, Joel I, Osteen is I so brilliant. I music and watch him. He, um... <laughs> He's basically, I think of him as, he's basically a life coach that drops Jesus into his spiel, like every, I timed it, it's like every 10 to 12 minutes, but essentially he's doing life coaching and then bang, there's the Jesus moment. Right. I mean, it's really quite brilliant. Yeah. And I think it's what keeps people because, you know, you started by talking about what is a religion and, you know, the word comes from a word which means to bind back. Yeah. So religion is really about people binding together yeah. as yeah. opposed to what they believe in, mm -hmm. that they're like ecclesia means mm -hmm. community, church. And people join religions because it gives them something. And some religions give them very clear answers. Some people want that, you know. People mm -hmm. don't come to UU churches for clear answers. Yeah. They are coming to ask questions rather than get answers. But for others, um, answers are comforting. It's what they need. And, you know, if those answers direct them towards behaviors that hurt other mm -hmm. people, then I think we need to step in and say, no, 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 those beliefs can't prevail. Yeah. Can't use beliefs like that to kill people or lock them up or you know, do some of the things people have done in the name of religion. But um, it's why people join cults. Yeah. They join cults because it gives them a feeling of community that they're hungry for. Yeah, we have a need to belong. That's right. Uh, I, a couple of thoughts uh, come to mind on that. Um, I had a friend 
who I met at the uh, Institute for Religion and Age of Science, which is the Star Island Conference. Uh -huh. And he talked very much like a, a humanist and never any God talk and everything, but he called himself a Christian. And I talked to him about it for, for a while, and he was saying the same thing. I love the, some of the, the, the principles of Christianity. I love some of the, the writings. Like the Simmer Lamont is a good example of that. But I don't think that Jesus was the Son of God. And, uh, you know, in fact, I don't have any kind of concept of what God he, But I've realized he's not a, to me, he's not a Christian. He's a Jesusist. <laughs> you know, and I think there are a, a lot Jesus of people that That's are, hard to say. Yeah, I know it is. <laughs> so, so, and I, so I think there's a lot of that. I, also, um, in one of the Pew surveys, it turned out that 1% of Catholics say they don't believe in God. That's 800,000 people. <laughs> the, the, the AHA has 32,000 members. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so you've got to be careful about... Uh, but they might believe in the church. Oh, exactly. Yeah. The, the cult, the, the, we totally underestimate the, uh, the power of culture on us. I right. was brought up as, uh, as an Episcopalian, mm -hmm. and I was, on the, I was an acolyte. I was chairman of the acolyte. I carried the cross in front of the uh, pr procession with all sure. the regalia on and everything. I loved to go back to Episcopal service, loved the music. Mm -hmm. I loved the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the ritual. You know, yeah. hate the philosophy. The frozen <laughs> chosen, as they say. What? what? <laughs> the frozen chosen. Yeah, right. My, yeah, my, 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 father, my father was, I think, was a closet uh, atheist. He used to say, uh, don't go to church anymore because it's, it's not there, he said. Right. He said, what's not there? He said, the holy cross-eyed bear. Yes. So, you know, um, one of the big differences between uh, Catholics and Protestants, yeah. or the, the altar-centered religions, Catholic, Lutheran, and Episcopalian uh, are the ultra-centered ones and the rest of the pulpit-centered ones, is that Catholics in particular can only get to God through the church. Mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been set up that way, whereas the whole Protestant Reformation was about people getting to the church through God. They turned it on its right. head. So for us, I mean, we're not even in the God-church construct. We're in the meaning-making construct. Mm -hmm. And yet we're still going through organizations. You're going through your organization. People are coming to this church. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the power of that? There's power in that. People joining communities, coming together to shape meaning. Even if you take out words like God and church. Right, right, right. So, anyway, um, you have a question in there about secular, right? What is, because I wanted what's to the, uh, well, yeah, what, is, what do we mean by secular or religious? And, uh, Right. Does one have to be one or the other? So I was raised in Squirrel Hill, and I was raised Jewish. And when I was growing up, um, my whole world was defined by being Jewish. But I wouldn't say we were religious. Um, we belonged to a temple. I was bas mitzvahed and confirmed. I, I did not have a non-Jewish friend growing up, because where would I meet them? Mm -hmm. I was in Jewish clubs, I went to a Jewish camp, I went to the Jewish community center. I mean, it's just really on and on and on and on. I was in the plays here in Oakland that we put on. And looking back on all of that, you know, I was raised at, a, at that sort of time between the Holocaust and the promise, you know, like the baby boom generation. And I would say that most of us could have easily called ourselves humanistic Jews. Mm -hmm. Even though we were going to temple, we were doing the things that you do yeah. when you're part of a religion. But I would not say that my family was religious. Right. I would say they were humanist. We were humanistic Jews, yeah. and I think that that would describe most Jews in America now. Mm -hmm. You know, the traditions, the culture, the identity right. is deep and strong. Yeah. So, to me, I really understand this difference between secular and religious. Right. <laughs> from my own background. Yeah. You remind me, I have a friend, a leader in the Society for Humanistic Judaism, mm -hmm. and he once said uh, uh, to me, there is no God and we are his chosen people. <laughs> <You know? laughs> which, which, I, right. which I think is probably what, That's you're, exactly right. what, what, you're, right. what you're saying. Um, yeah, I, I think that... Although <laughs> some scholars say that the Jews were his third choice. But we, we can get into that later. <laughs> yeah, right. go on. Right. Um, yeah, the, I, 
Secular, the, the meaning of secular originally, well, it depends on which, which originally you mean. From a political point of view, it meant uh, uh, a government separate from what the religion of the country was. Uh, some of the most religious countries have also been the most secular. Mm -hmm. Turkey was for a while, but not anymore. Uh, and some of the Scandinavian countries. It always fascinates me is that the, the, um, the, church, the, the countries that have a, a church, a country, a national religion, are some of the ones that have the most atheists and humanists. Well, Israel would be an example of that, actually. Hmm? Israel would be an oh, example, of a good example of that. It's sharply divided between the deeply religious Orthodox and the very secular Israeli population, mm -hmm. and it's the Orthodox who run the show, who make the rules, yeah. who make the laws. So, you know, it's, there's a real divide there. Yeah, and, and they do it because they have just enough to movie the majority yeah right. I mean England is another example of that yep. you know you make a religion a state religion and you can kill exactly. it pretty easily yeah yeah right they can right. kill the mean take so, the mean so, suck the meaning out of it so pretty I often quickly. wonder if maybe fighting church and state is wrong yeah <laughs> you know, we have a church yes. religion maybe we could have something to fight about right exactly yeah, okay, national religion I'm just kidding so secular and religious I mean those I'm not sure that are those really words that are opposite to one another? No, they're not. They're not. And I think it's a false, a false dichotomy, in, mm -hmm. my, in my opinion. Right. Because I think you can be religious and secular at the same mm -hmm. time, depending on how you define either one of the, those words. Again, it's, uh, it has, has to do with what particular background you're coming from and what circumstance you're describing. Uh, I think there are a, ver a lot of the Episcopalians, well, half of them anyway, are very yeah. secular. Right. You know? uh, the... Uh, a lot of the Lutherans are very, sure. from, a, from a separation of church and state kind of. Uh, so maybe we would have the opposite of secular be ecclesiastic. Or because theistic. that would imply under the auspices of a religious organization. Yeah. Yeah. Secular and Ecclesi ecclesiastic. Ecclesiastic. Not a bad, right. bad word for that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One thing we that you suggest that we, I think we should talk about it. And I, I mentioned to you that we already, it's one of our major um, uh, objectives this year is to, uh, is, to, is to look at whether or not humanism centers whiteness, you know, whether or not we're part of the, uh, of the what's been called white supremacy, uh, we're exercising white privilege. And Unitarian Universalism is doing I, the same thing. That's my answer is right. that yes, we are, just yeah. like, but I think we've taken on We've mm -hmm. taken that on. We've had, uh, like, like I mentioned, Tony Penn's been here, and we've uh, uh, Mandisa Th Thomas, who's the right. head of black uh, non-believers. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all uh, struggling, I think, to, uh, to make sure that we strike this balance between um, looking at things from a rational point of view and recognizing things that, that we, uh, in ourselves, that we should have recognized you know, years and years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's tough because uh, somebody once said, you don't want to be so open-minded that your brains fall out, you know. But you do want to make sure that you're, you're self-critical uh, enough to, to realize when, when you're really, the, thing, the things we have, uh, we have if we're white because mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're white. You know? What kind of things have you discovered as an organization or a movement around the question of that? Uh, I don't know if I can speak for the organization. I can speak for a few of us in it. And I, I think this whole, uh, what I would say is a, a turning, you know, um, in, uh, in our, our country, in our society, in, in, in Unitarian Universalism, and I hope in, uh, in the free thought uh, movement, uh, to recognize that there are, we have been swimming in a white sea, you know, and that there are, there are, the original sin is real in this country, both in terms of exterminating uh, native populations and in, in, in slavery that now is kind of being replicated by the way we uh, discriminate. Yeah. Um, I don't think that it's gonna be easy for any of us to kind of come to the, uh, to the real recognition of that. Yes. Uh, and I think that's why, why uh, we don't understand why uh, African Americans or people of color get so damn pissed off at us, because we don't really see it. And yeah. there's nothing worse, I think, 
than um, to, to a person who's being, whose life is, uh, is being challenged because of prejudice and suppression than indifference, you know. They'd almost rather have hate than indifference, and I think that that's, uh, that's something sure. that we'll, we'll all be fighting. And I'll admit, uh, it's a long process for me, and I think it's good. Right. It's, every one of us has got a different... Uh, a different well, it's, it. it's very hard to get outside your whiteness when you're used to being in it, yeah. like, and not explicitly in it in some sort of overtly racist way, but mm -hmm. it is the skin you, and the identity you've lived in. Yeah. And so getting outside of that enough to see it objectively, like I... I don't know that I would have noticed that and brought it up to you a year ago. Right. I think this past year has been a real push in liberal religious movements to really, really examine that and have that become embedded in the way we think about things. You know, I, I said to you earlier, uh, I worry a little bit about that cringe-inducing level of wokeness yeah. that sometimes feels like it finds its way into the conversation yep. and like you can't do or say anything right. Yeah. And uh, there has to be a learning curve for people to uh, uh, face their own uh, history and reality and learn mm -hmm. how to get outside yeah. centering whiteness. It's, it's very, very challenging because it's asking you to uncenter yourself in ways that maybe haven't even been conscious. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I um, just got back from the General Assembly, the U.S. Mm -hmm. General Assembly, and there was a yep. lot of discussion there around, around all this. And sometime yep. I had that feeling that there was a uh, uh, kind of narcissism of wokeness, you know, that some people have, you know, that they, I'm, I, I see the way things really are and you don't. And if we start, if we go into that with that kind of attitude, we're not, we're just going to, get people, you know... Uh, well, it's the opposite of free thought. Yeah. You know, I think part of free thinking is, again, that willingness to let other people express themselves without squashing them, judging mm -hmm. them, putting them in categories, yeah. uh, making them the enemy within your own community. Yeah. I mean, that worries me more than almost anything, is the splintering of mm -hmm. people within a group that has more in common than not. Right. And we really have to be careful. We're circling the wagons to defend ourselves. We don't turn the guns on exactly. each other. Exactly. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, uh, saying I want to hear what you have to say and I'd like to ask you yeah. to listen to me is one way how, to start. How, how, in your experience, how are you attacking? We have, we've had discussions around how to really approach this. and Yeah. Uh, what, what, would, what would really be good is to be able to have a communication, have a, a conversation. Mm -hmm. with people of color around this. But identifying that without going in as white saviors or going in as, as you know, as, uh, as we're going to solve this problem, really trying to learn and finding people to talk to in mm -hmm. that movement mm -hmm. has been really tough. How would you... How do you well, first of all, I think that if you're going to ask people from a marginalized population to talk to you, you let them set the agenda for the conversation. And you mm -hmm. say, here's what I'd like to learn. Uh, I think there are ways to do that without creating a lot of emotional labor for other people, although that's now become a sort of a buzz phrase mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. is that um, asking people to help you learn puts emotional labor on them. And I guess sometimes it does, but I also don't really know how else you're going to learn right. unless you talk to people in those communities. So I think um, creating safe environments in which as I said, whether we're talking about people of color, whether we're talking about people from the trans community, is allowing them to lead the conversation mm -hmm. and um, set sort of the frame. Yeah. I, I do think that this whole kind of, uh, I'm not here to teach you perspective doesn't really make sense. Is mm -hmm. if, if we're going to learn, we should learn from those communities and there may need to be right. some extension of, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? <laughs> Generosity? Mm -hmm. Sympathy? I don't Empathy. know what. Yeah. Just to um, uh, believe that the person coming to speak to them genuinely wishes to be an ally yeah. and wants to learn how to do that. One of, one of the approaches that UUA is taking with the Black Lives UU 
is essentially setting up uh, uh, funding and setting up a whole separate um, activity in yes. which was driven by uh, people of color in the Black Lives UU movement. Which is great. Which, 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 which yeah. I think is, is great. And it reminds me of ta when talking to some um, uh, black atheists and humanists that there is a different kind of humanism that in, in the black community. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to do with the, uh, the humanism of oppression, the humanism of uh, overcoming yes. uh, something, the humanism of being, of, of being there anyway, you know. And mm -hmm. it comes out in hip hop, it comes out in a lot sure. of different ways. And it seems to me that how do we balance this idea of everybody kind of coming together, the old integration sort of thing, we're all on this together, with this sort of necessity to separate out? Isn't that kind of like a, almost a segregation for good purposes? Uh, mm. So how do, how, do we, how do we stay together and yet let people develop on their, their own? Uh, uh, well, we have to, I do think that it's important to understand that we may say to a group of people from a marginalized community, we're all in this together, but they may be thinking, I've heard that yeah. before. <laughs> right, right. No, seriously. I know, I know what you and, mean. Yeah, okay, great. We've heard that before. Yep. that we're all in this together. What does that mean? Yeah. So I, I also think, as you said, some recognition of history and experience yeah. is very, very important. I'm not sure everybody is always going to, that in the end, we're going to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony right, right. through the magic carbonation of Coca-Cola yeah. or, you know, knit a daisy chain together and, like, dance off into the sunset. But there's a lot of room for yeah. coalition building, intersectionality, yeah people coming together. And I do think, you know, just dropping any kind of arrogance or condescension, regardless of what your perspective is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is one way also to yeah. come with some humility that you don't really know necessarily what other people's point of view yeah. is and why they value it. Why do they care about it? I mean, we don't have enough curiosity about people. I, in some of the couple counseling I do, it's one of the first things I notice is, are these people curious about each other? Do mm -hmm. they ask each other any questions at all? It's like one right, of the most important right. things in all relationships. And I think we could go into particularly sensitive conversations about religion mm -hmm. with more curiosity. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm genuinely interested in what you believe and why you believe why it. Believe it yeah. So it's good. Yeah. One thing to come to mind, one thing on the, uh, then we'll open for questions. Yeah. Um, that, I, that I think if something that stands or rings a bell with me is that one way we, who are privileged, can, can help us to use our privilege, you know, and, but to use it in a, right. in a way where we, we are supportive, not mm -hmm. directive. And so that's, maybe that's just kind of, kind of uh, as Tony says, you know, just keep pushing the ball up the hill, even if it comes back down again. It's the process. It's the, even right. if it's, and, and um, doing, what we, doing what we can without trying to make things change ourselves. Yeah, context is important too. You know, I grew up here, but I didn't realize how persistently segregated this city yeah. is until I moved back here as a, yep. an adult. And um, I think there is a context here in Pittsburgh that makes some of this maybe a little more difficult than it may be in some other places. And um, that's worth looking at as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, questions, comments, okay, yeah. Yep. arguments, outrage, <laughs> delight, <laughs> a prayer. What do you have? <laughs> I, was, I sort of have the feeling that you come to being a free thinker or a humanist by having learned. That's for the video, so speak into the top of it. Oh, OK. I kind of think you come to being a humanist or a Unitarian by first having learned what some religion is and then migrating. And I know one of the jokes about Unitarians is it's for agnostics with children. Mm -hmm. But it? it's for agnostics with yeah. children so that you can give them an education they so that they don't end up in a cult of some kind. Uh -huh. Because cults can be attractive if you don't know their history, where they're coming from, if you see it for the first time. So I'm wondering whether you kind of agree with that, that, it's, that you need to sort of pass through the religious education and then yeah. figure out what you think. You take the UU, I'll take the humanist. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Agnostics with children, that's a good one. I mean, there's some truth in that. I think that in general, uh, it used to be that, you know, a couple would have children and the kids would start to grow up. It's like, we better find ourselves a religious community. You know, that was a cornerstone of people's lives. It's not so much a cornerstone anymore. That's sad to me. It certainly was when I was raising my kids as Unitarian Universalists. Um, I mean, you look at Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, and temples, and you see how once kids grow up, attendance falls off. So I don't know that it's just, just us. And there are people that are birthright Unitarian Universalists, like back generations and centuries. Remember, religion's been in this country since the 1600s and in the world since the 1500s. So it's, it's not newfangled like some people think it is. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. <laughs> and did she? No. So one of the one of the snide comments from one of my colleagues is that all you need to start a UU church is a coffee pot and resentment. <laughs> so John, what did you have to yeah. say? I, I'll speak for humanists and atheists. Uh, there's a new book out by John Gray called Seven Types of Atheism. And he looks at the different ways people come to a kind of an atheist life perspective. Uh, and one of them is they've gone through a religion and they've kind of dropped off little bits and pieces of it until finally they're left with uh, uh, just the culture and not the religion, you know. Uh, and that's kind of the humanist book. There are people who just never were exposed to religion and just never had a need for it and were sort of birthright atheists, you know. <laughs> I think there, there are that. And there are people who are really teed off about the uh, the religion of their of, of of their youth and what they and how they feel that they were misled lied to and how how and develop uh, i think opinions that religions cause a lot of the harms in the world and they do cause some of them but not not all of them but i mean communism and mm -hmm. nazism mm -hmm. are pretty <laughs> pretty bad too uh, and i th so i think and, and there are there are there are couple of other ways of doing it. But there are lots of ways to, 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 to coming to atheism, very similar to, I think, uh, Unitarian Universalism. Definitely. I wrote down seven types of atheism because it would make a good sermon. Yeah. <laughs> Shameless. You're going you're to write seven types of theism? Or is it? <laughs> uh, there's at least seven types of that. Andy, did you have something you wanted to say? <laughs> Um, so, Robin, you started us off with the question, how free is free thought? Um, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, and I, I sort of want to follow up with a, a follow-up question, which is free from what? Um, so, I think the, it, there seemed to be a, uh, mm. an agreement between both of you that some thinking is free and other thinking is somehow not free. And I think by at, drilling down on the question, free from what, we can actually gain some clarity about what free thinking is, and then we can come to the question of whether theism is gen can be free or not. Um, so, so here's some of the things that came up uh, in, in the course of your discussion that speak to the question of what is it, what, when we think about some thinking as being free, what are we thinking it's free from or free of? And here's some of the things that, that came up. Uh, you mentioned dogmatism and creeds can tie people down, tie thinking down, right? Um, you mentioned institutional power can constrain sure. thinking. Um, and of course, there are all kinds of religions that have belief requirements. And, and uh, if you want to belong to that religion, you will tow the, mm -hmm. the belief requirements line. And should you cross that line, you are exiled. Um, and so, in, in a very straightforward sense, that's one way to restrict mm -hmm. thinking, right? Um, you mentioned um, the, the phenomenon of having somebody challenge our beliefs and being triggered. When we're triggered and our emotions take over, in a certain sense, we're not thinking freely anymore. Our emotions are mm -hmm. preventing us from thinking clearly. So there are all these kinds of things you 
that, that can hijack thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from large institutional things to small emotional things. Um, and we have to, I think, be specific about which of those things we have in mind when we're talking about free thinkers. And, and I don't, it's hard for me to imagine making real headway on the question of you know, whether theism, whether theists can be free thinkers mm -hmm. without unpacking what free means there. Well, I think your, un, your word on... Yeah. Well, only because I, I, I want to... I mean, I'm not a theist myself, but as a Unitarian minister, I, I feel um, inclined, and not under any duress, by the way, to make sure that everybody's, if, if we really are going to be a religion that upholds the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, then I can't tell somebody that if they still have a resonance for Jesus, that they have a resonance for the God they find in the whirlwind, that they're wrong. Because then why, are I, why am I here? And why are they here? You know, so we definitely need to check our biases. And as somebody who stands up in the pulpit and Orates, I have to be very sensitive to what I say while also presenting something that has some meaning and value. You know, I don't want to get it like smashed down to nothingness. But I never denigrate people's belief systems, you know, from the pulpit in particular. I might raise challenges and questions, but you know, one of the things we didn't cover was what the word mystical means, or can you, what, what was your question, what was the question? Get word. Something about what is the meaning of mystical and mystery uh, to a yeah. person? So one of the things that I always find myself amazed by when I'm in um, amongst humanist um, cohort, you guys, is don't you feel awe? Don't you feel wonder? Don't yeah. you sometimes look at like the Grand Canyon and go, wow, that's not no. just a crevice in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like I, I feel like somehow it's like we need to like make sure that there's no mystery and no mysticism and no mm. wonder. It's like, why? Why can't you have that in the mix? John. <laughs> I, I think we uh, definitely recognize mystery. It's what drives me as a scientist, you know, was uh, what's, well, how um, amazing things are and I wonder how it works, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think what we don't do is we don't worship mystery. You know, we don't we don't think there's something more than there than stuff that we don't. I mean, I think I, I wake up some mornings and just can't believe that I'm alive. You mm -hmm. know? I think uh, I think we tend to be a little bit more introspective about that stuff, but I think we always feel it. Sure. And I think uh, I've been in in gatherings where um, there have been. Uh, Ceremonies, for example, there is the star ceremony for birthday. That mm -hmm. uh, on your birthday, uh, there's a star somewhere whose light began the day you were born. So on that day, that star is yours, you know. And that's that's really kind of cool. Sure. You know? But it's part of the whole natural world, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. Yes. I I think that um, we could use a lot more of it. I think we are a little bit uh, <clears throat> as we realize how much. Um, intellect and emotion are wrapped up together, that we make decisions based on both, uh, it's really important that we have informed emotions, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's important that we don't, uh, we don't just have negate the feelings of others when, we, when we're coming uh, with, a, sure. with, a, with a thought. So if I said to you that, so I, you once asked me about this, I described myself as a mystical humanist, and I remember you once said, yeah. what does that mean? So, um, if I told you I had, had a transcendent moment, mm -hmm. what would your response be to that? Well, as long as it wasn't about Jesus or about <laughs> something like you know? Why not? <laughs> you know? Why not? I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be in my case, but why, why, why are you putting that line in the sand that it can't be about uh, because Jesus? Because that, again, creates some kind of external thing to, to reality and clouds your thinking. So what if I said to you, I, I, I'm going to make this up. I say, you know, I... I had the most amazing experience. I was hiking on this trail, and I literally felt like Jesus came and was standing next to me on the trail. Mm -hmm. What would you say? Uh, it's, it's, as long as you didn't talk to me, talk back. <laughs> oh, yeah, we had a great conversation, actually. <laughs> well, well, You'd I, say you need to see a shrink. Yeah, that's, that's, that's schizophrenia. <laughs> 
Well, actually, it isn't. But I know. Yeah. It is. So I, I, I kind realize of, that. I think the reason I call myself a mystical humanist is that I'm, I am a humanist. I'm not a theist. I'm not an atheist either. And I, I am open to the idea of yeah. mystical, spiritual, and transcendent yeah. experiences. It isn't for me to say that didn't happen unless it's like so no, clearly I, coming I, out of a deranged mind. Yeah, and I don't think the experiences are having experience mm -hmm. is fake. You know. I think when you when you assign an attribute to that experience, that's when it gets a little iffy. You, you know? mean like a word like transcendent? No, transcendent is okay. fine. I, I think, I think, uh, in a way, evolution is a form of transcendence. You mm -hmm. know? It's a bunch of things coming together to create something a little bit more. Sure. You know, so it's trans molecules transcend atoms. You know, cells transcend molecules, and I think in human societies, relationships transcend relationships to to become bigger and better things. So Absolutely. I think transcendence, but my, my theory, transcendence doesn't, doesn't mean skipping from here to mm -hmm. some other place. It means growing out of, of what's already sure. there to a higher place. Do you think that your group has an unspoken expectation that people won't talk about being spiritual? Yeah. I, and I, I, think, uh, I think, again, that's the, the treacherous sea of words. Okay. I just, I ask that because I think... Um, Maybe it's uh, threatening for people to talk about being spiritual in a group that is so um, committed. You mean threatening to, because they're afraid they might have to might find something else? No, that, I just wonder if that's something a conversation that I'd can like happen in this group else. that people can talk about their idea of being spiritual or I, being I spiritual. Bill, Bill's scared to death yeah. on their own. <laughs> wait, 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 Bill. You need to use this for the video. <laughs> I've been told it's a rule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got to follow the rules. Um, one of the things that uh, there's been no mention so far of any importance, and I sense that there that we aren't seeing the same importance attached to evidentiary support that most of us consider important. Um, that you know, for instance, when you talk about transcendent experiences and mystical this and that, uh, those are all feelings. Okay, there is no. Hooray. <laughs> those those are all anecdotal, personal revelation kind of things, which are not legitimate evidence. So therefore, they cannot carry the same weight as something that actually happens. Like for, and and again, going back to the Grand Canyon. We like the Grand Canyon and we are impressed by it, but we also like knowing how it was formed and the forces at work and the, the laws of physics that made it happen. And, and that's much more important than, oh, God did it, kind of thing. To you. I'm not too sure I'm understanding your definition of religion. I, I really like spiritual. Well, rel spiritual. Rel religion, and I and I, I and I think I, I go go to what I, I, Andy will mm -hmm. know the Dan Dennett definition a lot better than I do. Mm -hmm. But it, it, religion is a belief in a supernatural being, and you seek approval mm -hmm. from that supernatural Some being religion. for yes. the things you do. Well, That's what is a religion that believes in a supernatural? <laughs> I think you're saying, no, no, there are religions that don't believe in a supernatural yes, there are. being. And well, I do like Dan Nevitt, Dennett's definition, because I think it's very clear. <laughs> if you don't believe in a, in, Things, in a supernatural being, and you are not trying to seek approval of a supernatural being, I think okay. it's, that's yeah. more of what I think of a... Okay, but that, that wasn't really the point that we were bringing up. I, I hear what you're, you're saying, but... Not all religions seek approval from a supernatural being. Buddhism doesn't seek approval from a supernatural being. Unitarian Universalism doesn't seek approval from a supernatural being. That's a very particular construct. But, that, but I, I don't want to get into that because that's not really where we were going with this conversation right now. It's, is this group willing to hear that people within it have spiritual experiences and a spiritual life? Suzanne. Can I say one thing about this the last, last subject uh, before we get? Um, I, I'm a scientist, and one thing that you've got to realize about science is 
it's organized experience. I mean, we don't know anything uh, except for the way we experience it. We have tools that extend our ability to experience things, but it's still experience. So it's to say that this, this rationality and this experience is another false dichotomy. It's all wrapped up together. I think the that... Spirituality is all about experience. And, and, well, well, yeah, and, and I think yeah. that it, it doesn't mean you have to say that there's unexplained, uh, unexplainable, mm -hmm. maybe unexplained, but unexplained experience, you know. I'm sure that, uh, I mean, there used to be the feeling of near death where you saw this white tunnel, you know, and that was like supposed to be the way to God and everything else. What it is is the light, all your neurons, that your inhibitory neurons are shutting down and, all you see, and everything else lights up and you see a tunnel, you know. So that there, there are, um, even though it's a, an experience, but sometimes you can explain the way out of something that's fun. You know, well, and, and, I, and I think that's the kind of the wrong thing. And you know, somebody said, and I thought it was so simple and brilliant, and I happen to think it's partially true, is that science is the way we explain the world, and religion is the way to live mm -hmm. in it, or at least that's how people see those, can see those things, is, yeah, science explains the world, mm -hmm. and people gravitate toward religions to find a way to live in the world, and they don't cancel each other out. Okay. For a number of years after I became an atheist, I described myself as a spiritual atheist, and I actually used that term, spiritual yeah. atheist. And what I meant by it was that I still felt this kind of connection to the natural world and being able to look at a tiny flower and say, yeah. oh my God, you know, the whole world is in this tiny flower. And this sense... Now, I, unfortunately, have become much more cynical since then in the last few years, you know, and I sort of miss that sense that I had that I, when I was able to describe myself as being a spiritual atheist rather than just a freaking angry atheist, mm -hmm. which is what I am now. Not angry, but cynical, you yeah, know, and yeah. kind of, it's all science and nothing else. Yeah. And so I think there is a way to speak of spirituality that doesn't involve a belief in God but is a way of saying, I feel the beauty of the world, which everybody does, like, yeah. hopefully. How many of you do yoga? How many of you meditate? How many of you do Tai Chi? Okay, these are all ways that people get out of their mind and yeah. into this other level of experience. So, yeah, you know, they don't, you don't have to cancel one thing out mm. to be in the other place. But as he was saying, John was saying, though, that, you know, if, you, if I were to go to one of your meetings and say, well, I'm a spiritual person, you know, even though I was an atheist, people would be uncomfortable with yeah, that. Yeah. And maybe we should be a little bit more open yep. to that concept that yep. spirituality... There's another project for you all. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, right. An yeah. awestruck atheist. Yeah. Now, that's, yeah. a way. that's, that's a good term. That would, All right. not, so, that would not turn anybody... That would look. not be confusing. That's a good term. Awestruck atheist. Thank you, Suzanne. Can, can I... Can oh, I you're awesome. awesome. Something they'd like to add. Can, yeah. Awestruck. One way I find it uh, to deal with the matter, uh, I'm a 21st century deist. And we're watching a cosmos that's on autopilot. And we enjoy seeing what develops that, like you pointed out, may have started three billion years ago. We're only now seeing it. One of the big things that is developing today is the insight into the mind. I heard something about two months ago on public radio. And they were saying how doctors now have to be very careful how they describe or talk to their patients about pains and things of that nature because if they start agreeing too much or get into a place where they actually feed what the person might take and make into something there that's not really there mm -hmm. and that's the capacity of the mind to imagine and it's psychosomatic it, it's and they've done research on it and they're beginning to realize it so when you're dealing with a doctor and they sometimes get a little bit indefinite with you. They're probably avoiding it. They don't want to put some a germ into your brain that would in your mind and how you think. And you feel then something that's not there. Yeah. Well we could stick around for hours and also talk about
about morality and what makes us good and all sorts of fantastic, juicy, wonderful topics. What else? Who else would like to share something? Yeah. I was a born-again Christian for two years, and the emotional security of knowing I had the truth was mm -hmm. tremendous. But it was emotional. But I believed it was real, and that I, and that I prayed to God, and God listened. It all fell apart when the minister was saying, you can't vote for a Catholic for president, and I was campaigning for John Kennedy. Other things got in the way, like evolution as well. And I went through a time of being spiritual, believing there was a universal spirit that I could connect to or at least get in sync with. And then I realized that was an emotion too. And that there isn't security in knowing what is real. The act of seeking out and trying to find the answers is the path that I've taken without needing the security, the emotional security of knowing I have found the answer. And being with other people who are doing the same thing is the connection that I enjoy. I've been to the Grand Canyon, I've been to the Sequoias and felt that awe. You don't have to believe that God created it in order to feel the awe of the universe that we are in. But that's an emotion. And emotions are fleeting they're rewarding, or they can not be rewarding, but uh, they're fleeting. And the seeking, and that to me is the important thing, and seeking with other people. Mm -hmm. Although I would argue that thoughts are sometimes no more dependable than emotions. And I, I also think, you know, that it's hard to be a human being. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy to be a person. We've all discovered that. You know, we're all fighting private battles and living in this world. And people, people will turn to all sorts of resources to live their human life. And it's, I think, when things become sort of in a funhouse mirror and religion becomes twisted or even thinking becomes twisted, mm -hmm. too much of either, I think, can become a real problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've always thought that blending you know, reason and wonder in some sort of balanced, healthy way mm -hmm. is certainly the way I'd like to try to move through yeah. this existential reality. Yeah. I say one thing about it, about <clears throat> as I get older, uh, of course, I'm, most of my life I've thought about mortality, you know, and the more I'm convinced that this is all there is, the more I think about the way things are now, you know. And it sets up a kind of a responsibility and empathy because all we have is now, you know. There is this, so a fear and hope for the future is something we should just uh, right. neglect, just, uh, just put aside. And I was thinking one time that uh, we're born and we die, we have that space in between. And uh, one, as somebody once said, when one of us dies, the universe dies. Because all we know is, is what we have in our brains and in our feelings and in our so when I'm sitting across from another human being, I'm sitting across from the universe, you know, mm. and uh, the kind of empathy that I mean, generates emotion now, that kind of empathy that that generates, sure, is uh, is is something that I think is a purely humanist uh, emotion because it doesn't come from God; it comes from being human. It comes from having having a species that survive after three and a half billion years of evolution. Uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of animals, a lot of things that died for us to be here, you know. And we owe a lot to each other mm -hmm. because all we have is each other, you know. And I think if, if you bound reality, your life, to just this peace and time, you'll see how important it is that you treat other people in a decent Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Unitarian Universalism does not have an eschatology, meaning right. a theology about the afterlife. Right that has anything to do with trying to figure out what's going to happen to you after you die. It's very this-worldly. It's very much about what you're saying. Here we are. What will we do with our one wild and precious mm -hmm. life? What kind of beachhead for justice and love can we establish right now? Yep. 
And I do think, you know, that's one of the carrot and sticks that I find the most painful and damaging in some religions, is encouraging people to live for what will happen to them after right. they die, instead of focusing on what they can do mm -hmm. in the here and now. And what we can do. And what we can do together. Yeah. So, it's 8.15. I know many people want to get home and see the first of two debates. Thank you for being so... If you can bear it. <laughs> and of course, this is all to defeat a president who once said his favorite book in the Bible was the one about the two Corinthians. So God, <laughs> or whatever you believe in, help us. Liz. Thank you so much, oh, Robin you. and John.